We have waited two years to gain access to this location. It was first built in the 1100s, steeped in history and steeped in paranormal activity. We'll be spending the next two nights locked into this location. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the most haunted castle in England. Welcome to St Breville's. I'd like to speak to any spirits that are with us at the moment. It's like partially blacked out and I don't know why. I can see it, yeah. You can see it, okay. So something caught my eye and there's a sliver of light coming down the picture there. And I saw a shadow figure walk from the side of the, the left hand side of the fireplace and it almost looked like it looked at me but I couldn't see any features. Can you do something to let us all know that you can hear us? If I hold out my hand St Breville's Castle was constructed sometime between 1075 and 1129 by royal mandate. Walter de Gloucester, the Sheriff of Gloucester, and his son Miles de Gloucester made St Breville's Castle the administrative centre of the Forest of Dean. Royal forests in the early medieval period were subject to special royal jurisdiction. Forest law was harsh and arbitrary a matter purely for the king's will. Forests were expected to supply the king with hunting grounds, raw materials, goods and money. The forest of Dean could be used for hunting but was more important to the king as a major metalworking centre thanks to the plentiful supply of trees for making charcoal and the iron deposits in the limestone of the region. The iron goods constructed locally were stored at the castle before being shipped off to other locations. The quantities being produced were substantial. King John enjoyed regular hunting in the forest each November and used St Breville's Castle as a base for such trips. The castle imposed a relatively large number of fines for illegal wood cutting and the poaching of venison during the period. The castle also began to be used as a prison shortly afterwards, particularly for forest trespassers and for those who could not pay the required fines. After King John's death, St Breville's Castle became the primary centre for English quarrel manufacture.
The crossbow was an important military advance on the older shorter bow and was the favoured weapon by the time of Richard I. Many crossbows and even more quarrels were needed to supply royal forces. Crossbows were primarily built at the Tower of London, but St Breville's Castle, with the local forest to provide raw materials, became the national centre for quarrel manufacture. In 1228, John Malmont, William the Smith and William the Fletcher arrived at the castle, beginning production operations at a forge built within the bailey. Now a centre for arms manufacture, the castle was made more secure with a new defence ditch, freshly prepared walls and a new chapel. The castle was garrisoned with royal troops during the uprising of Richard Marshall against Henry III in 1233. Another indicator of the military importance of the castle and the surrounding forest was the £20 fee each year being paid to the constable of the castle. Under Edward I, the massive gatehouse was built to protect the castle entrance. There has been speculation that the royal architect James of St George may have been responsible for the building work. The reason for the king extending the castle at this time is unclear, as the castle was relatively far away from the Welsh border and in no particular risk of attack. One popular explanation is the quantities of weapons and money being stored at the property by this time. The castle had been in a slow period of decline for many years, similar to that of several other royal castles in the region. Minor improvements were made, including various light windows added to the internal buildings in the 15th century. In the 18th century, many of the buildings inside the bailey were knocked down and the more valuable materials, including the lead from the roof, was recycled. The keep partially collapsed in 1752, with the remainder falling down in 1777. The castle was now principally a prison and a court still operating under the authority of the constable and the forest law originally established in 1217. The remaining buildings inside the bailey were converted into a courtroom and a jury room with the west side of the gatehouse being used as a jail for detaining prisoners. Individuals unable to pay their debts or fines could be detained in prison indefinitely to encourage payment. The conditions in the castle prison became increasingly notorious after a visit from the prison reformer John Howard in 1775 as part of his research for the first edition of his book The State of the Prisons. Howard found the prison greatly out of repair with two inmates locked in a single room without exercise for the best part of a year, with no fresh water, financial support or firewood. Graffiti on the stone walls of the castle jail includes the mournful inscription by a prisoner of the period, for I have been here a great space and I am weary of the place. The debtor's prison at the castle came in for particular scrutiny. It emerged that out of 402 cases brought before the court at St Breville's Castle, 397 of them were for extremely small sums of debt and were increasingly unacceptable in Victorian eyes. The investigation found that the keeper of the debtor's prison, which could hold up to six inmates at a time, was appointed by the constable and made part of his income by charging each prisoner one shilling a week for the use of the beds in the prison. 
With no other public funding, prisoners depended on friends or relatives for food and other essentials, or from donations from their original parishes. Prison reforms followed, including improving the conditions of the castle facilities. Although visitors continue to note how the castle was patched and cobbled like a worn out shoe. In 1838, the role of constable was transformed into the chief commissioner of woods and forests. The court and jury rooms were turned into a local school. Although occasional courts of attachment were held in the chapel, the castle retained its function as a prison until 1842. We meet up with Linda Harrison, the manager of St Breville's Castle. Okay, Linda, pleasure to meet you. Thank you for uh, letting us investigate your castle. And it's been two years, a long way, a long time, and now we're finally in. So um, thank you for having us. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about St Breville's Castle? Uh, History-wise? Yes, please. Yeah, lovely. So it's, it dates back to the early 1100s. If you want to go really far back, just after William the Conqueror, there's a wooden castle around here somewhere, but the, the kind of the big castle, the, the, the kind of tower and original moat would have been the 1100s. And then the bit we're sitting in is all the 1200s. Very important centre for the king because he got his royal forester dean just down the road. So this was the administration centre. Made sure that people weren't taking things from the forest. They shouldn't be sending his police force out to, to check that they were doing what they should be doing. Okay. Count the taxes. Yeah. That's the, the castle. And they used to make um, armoury here for bows and arrows. Is that correct? It's uh, crossbow bolts, so okay. they, uh, the, fun, the finest ore in the country was just down the road in the forest as well, so around here you have to imagine about a hundred smithies hammering hammer, the hammers onto their anvils and uh, producing crossbow bolts, hundreds of thousands of the things a year, and also horseshoes, and they'd go off on the kingly campaigns down to the, the kind of the Holy Land on the Crusades, cross to Ireland for campaigns, so... Yeah, there's, they, there's two guys that they, they've made about a million in, in across the course of ten years. There's kind of records of the amount of crossbow bolts. So all stored here in the castle. It was a very important munitions centre kind of when you go into the late 1200s. And uh, yeah, so it was a very important site at one point in the country for the king. Okay. Um, and King John? This was, uh, he, he used the area for hunting and he stayed here a few times. Apparently. Yeah, so King John very much treated it as a pleasure kind of palace, really. He built himself a big banqueting hall and made improvements so that he could come and have a nice comfortable stay while he went and hunted uh, down in the forest. And there's records of him coming on several occasions, so it was kind of quite a popular part of his annual tour around the kingdom, was to come over here. Yeah, and, and this castle was handed down so many times i mean if you was to sit here and tell me the full history we would be here for hours and absolutely hours and i mean hours. it's just so rich i mean that's just when it's at its height the high medieval period is really when the castle was in its heyday but since then you know it became more of a, a local courts and um, a kind of a prison really it was a debtor's prison uh, until the 1830s then it was a village school uh, used as for the local businesses as, as a place to come, like a carpentry workshop for a while. Uh, and then, luckily, somebody decided to turn it into a private house in the late Victorian period. And it's always been Crown Estate. There's only a few years of all of its history going back 900 years when it wasn't belonging to some royal or other. Um, and the Crown Estate decided to make it into a private house in the late Victorian era. And it was used as that until the 1930s. And then... So when did the yeah. actual castle stop being a castle? Probably, it's, it's difficult to say, but a lot of reports say that if, when you've got the Black Plague in the, in, in the, kind of the, the 1350s was really when it started to, to end its height of importance and it, 
everything just moved away from here really so it was still an important administration centre but then it became more of a regional administration centre still had a constable and guards still looked after things in the local area but not as important as it was once was in the kind of the 12th 13th 14th centuries now you see, you know you mentioned the prison here um, local people were thrown in the dungeons shall we say how long did that go on for because I, I did read that it did get sort of stopped by some sort of commission because they they thought the living conditions were absolutely dreadful um, so when did that start becoming an actual prison we don't know the exact date of our room that we call the prison. We know that it ended in the 1830s. We know that if you go back into kind of the 1500s, they were holding kind of like prisoners of war here, probably waiting to take them around to Bristol, the Tower of London, to ransom them back to their families. But where they were held in the castle, that's lost in time. We don't really know which part they would have been held in. But certainly that prison must have been there for a good two, three, four hundred years because of the graffiti that's on the walls I and mean, mostly it's from the 1600s, the graffiti that remains, but the windmills that are on the wall are believed to date back to the 1500s. So. And, and are the, are, is that graffiti from, uh, I was reading about uh, the villagers and people that were stealing things from, from the forest and, and they were brought here, as it, that was a crime was it, to steal wood and that yeah, I mean, if you took, at one point, if you took anything from the king's forest, so if you say your family was starving and you decided to do some poaching, the, the penalty was death. So you would be brought here to be brought in front of the court and then lightly taken upstairs and hung from the front of the castle as a way of saying, don't do that, don't steal from the king. Mm -hmm. So it, that was kind of what it was used for a long time for, for local people, but also the political prisoners that were here as well. Okay, so moving on from that side of things, you've been here for quite some time, so what are the stories that you've heard, uh, what, have you, even um, anything that you've felt or seen, so well, what's actually been going on here over the years? We've had a lot of paranormal investigators, so I've, I've heard a lot of stories about what have, what's been found and there's lots of historic um, kind of tales, that, the tales of headless horsemen kind of riding up and into the grounds and disappearing on misty nights. Um, children playing in the East Tower, there's kind of like stories of, you know, you'll hear them running up the stairs and moving furniture above you, but there'll be nobody else in the building. Um, the, the classic, the, ba the baby crying is the, is the famous one. And that's um, the baby that was found during renovations. Yeah, that they found found, the actually book. found a skeleton during renovations um, and there's lots of reports. I mean, I've had a school teacher here who she hears it every time she comes. Their school's been coming for 40 odd years and she says every time she stays, she always hears it. We had um, a couple of people come down to reception one day um, and they said, oh, thank goodness that baby stopped crying last night. And we were kind of like, what baby? Because mm -hmm. they were staying here on their own. They'd been out, come back in, walked up the stairs just behind us here, heard the baby crying and kind of like, then it stopped. So yeah. it's kind of like, and they didn't know anything about the kind of paranormal side. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And there's also lots of shadow figures that are seen in several rooms. Yeah, we've had people come and report having kind of like, they're described as either shadows that you see out the corner of your eye or a cowled figure that you can just feel that something's looming over you overnight, kind of disturbing your sleep. So what do you think are, which that you've heard, are some of the areas that, that paranormal activity seems to happen most? From the details, I say definitely the, what we call our banquet hall now, which in the past was kind of the, the kind of the main courthouse. Um, certainly tales in there, um, up in the guard room, which also was known as the guard hanging room at one point, because it's very much associated with the kind of the death penalty out the front of the castle. But lots of reports up there of, of kind of just things moving and people being shoved, and kind of like just a, a general presence up there that doesn't want anybody to be in that part of the building. Um, the prison, we've had a few things in the prison, people yeah. always kind of get um, 
there are tales of the lady in grey who kind of walks through there and out through into what is the banqueting hall area. Any rooms that you don't like? Um, from a kind of a purely housekeeping point of view, there are, there are rooms that I kind of prefer to clean other than others. But uh, I think, I don't know, I think there are... I've always had a good feeling in the castle, so I've always been made to feel welcome. I can see what people mean about the guard room and it not feeling that nice, but I think for me it's because you're quite isolated up there on your own and it is quite, it's not got the high ceilings of the other room, so it does feel quite claustrophobic and enclosed anyway. So, so perhaps, perhaps that room, but I, I don't know, I just generally get a good vibe when I walk around the castle. So. Excellent. Linda, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. The paranormal reports are as follows. In the solar room, also the banquet hall, the sound of a baby crying is heard coming from within the room. During the renovations to the ceiling, the wrapped up corpse of a baby was found in the rafters. The hanging room and guard room. Unexplained noises are heard. A dark mass in the shape of a figure has been seen standing at the doorway. Visitors are pushed violently and a praying figure of a lady is seen. Inside the prison, poltergeist activity is reported. Furniture moving, voices, footsteps, the sound of growling and visitors are grabbed by unseen hands. The Porter's Lodge. Visitors being pinned down in their beds while sleeping. A misty figure standing at the fireplace. Unexplained noises and the sound of a child crying. The old kitchen. Pebbles are reported to materialize and fall from the ceiling, along with disembodied voices of women talking. The state apartments. The sound of violins are heard. Footsteps next to the beds and outside in the corridor. Loud bangs on the walls. A young girl in white has been seen at the end of the corridor and has been seen to walk straight through a wall. And a dark entity has been seen inside the room. We arrange our sleeping areas and we have all chosen rooms where we are separated from each other so we are completely isolated. Mark has chosen to sleep in the guard room and hanging room which is on the second floor where noises and footsteps are heard. A dark figure is seen standing in the doorway. A praying figure of a lady has been seen and visitors are pushed violently. Phil has decided to stay in the prison where poltergeist activity takes place. Voices, footsteps are heard, growling sounds and visitors have been grabbed by unseen hands. and I have taken Queen Isabella's room on the first floor where I will be surrounded by several haunted rooms the solar and banquet room where cries of a baby is heard the hallway where a girl in a white dress has been seen and the state apartments where there are reports of footsteps, loud banging sounds, the sounds of violins playing and a dark entity who stands in the doorway.
Mark goes to use the bathroom where we then hear him call out. What's happening? Hey. What happened, Mark? Well, I was coming out of the WC and went to look. Well, I wasn't even looking in there to be honest. And something caught my eye, and there's a sliver of light coming down the picture there. And I saw a shadow figure walk from the side of the, the left-hand side of the fireplace, and it almost looked like it looked at me, but I couldn't see any features. And it went fully across that white bit in the picture caused by the window and then I lost it because I, I, it made me jump and I lost it because of the, the wall here. So it looked like it either went in the wall or went out of what would have been the doorway there. With Mark seeing a shadow figure, we decide to start off our investigation within the old stables. So here we are in the, what's known as the old stables. And this is where earlier on, before we got set up, Mark was uh, passing the doorway and um, he saw a shadow figure move along the wall where the fireplace is behind me. Now, So I'm just waiting for my eyes to get used to the light because I'm looking back down at the doorway right at the bottom and it looks in the middle black tower. Yeah, it is. Is something... I can't get it because of the camera. Okay. It's like partially blacked out and I don't know why. I can see it, yeah. You can see it, okay. So, Mark saw a shadow figure move along the fireplace behind me. Um, we've got a motion detector light down the end there. And that's, uh, that's facing out into the hallway, so if anything moves it should go off. And also, uh, we've got a REM pod on the fireplace. Whoever it was that was in this room earlier, can you do something to let us all know that you can hear us? We receive our first EVP from within the stables, but we cannot decipher what is being said. Here is the enhanced audio. Can you do something to let us all know that you can hear us? Can you do something to let us all know that you can hear us? Can you hear us? Perhaps you can tell us your name. My name's Jeff. The gentleman there is Mark. And the gentleman over there is Phil. Can you tell us your name, please? I was hearing some sort of noise that I haven't heard before, like a, a clicking noise, tapping noises. 
Are you down there? Is it possible you could come and join us in the old stables? All fell silent in the old stables, so we made our way to the old kitchen, which is also located on the ground floor, with the reports of pebbles materialising and falling from the ceiling, and also disembodied voices of women talking. Okay, we've um, come into the old kitchen. I'd like to speak to any spirits that are with us at the moment. My name is Philip. And the gentleman just there is Mark. And the other chap on the stairs is Jeff. Would you be able to come and join me so we could Talk. This is quite an interesting kitchen, this, because it's one of the very few places which has still got a dog spit, where they put a specially bred dog inside to to basically move a wheel round and that would um, turn the spit over the fire. Now this castle is obviously quite big and this seems a very small kitchen so I assume it used to be much bigger. Is that right? There is obviously a, a fireplace there, but I don't see any evidence of ranges or anything else kitchen related. What was it like? What was it like here? Can you see me sat here? Phil asks what it was like to work in the kitchen and he receives a response, a man's voice saying, it's all right. Here is the enhanced audio taken from Phil's digital recorder. Can you see me sat here? Can you see me sat here? Move something now. Please. Can you make the ceiling lights move? Can you sit next to me? If I move over slightly. Did you just sit down? How about if I hold out my hand? Can you touch me? Another EVP is captured. Phil holds out his hand and a voice says, hand. Here is the audio enhanced. How about if I hold out my hand? 
Can you touch me? How about if I hold out my hand? Can you touch me? We complete our session in the old kitchen. Phil, Mark and I go to our rooms to get changed and then we would meet up back down in the old stable for food and drinks. So we've done our little first few sessions here and uh, we know we've seen and heard a few things. We haven't reviewed anything yet, but um, after we did do um, our sessions, um, we went our own ways, we've picked our rooms. Um, so, um, Mark, where are you I'm staying the, tonight? The, what they call the hanging room. So, you, so you're in the hanging room? Yep. And there's lots of activity in there. I've already had lots of activity happen to me while I was on my own. Um, really, really, really loud footsteps coming from well, where, where my bed is. It's in, it's in like an alcove of one of these. Stop. Of, there was a noise from down there. There was. I didn't hear that. Was I did. There's a, a definite noise. Like a door knob. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Shit. Can you make that noise again, please? So if we um, just try to explain what happened was um, when we done our sessions, we finished and we, we decided to pick our own rooms. So um, the idea was to go for a shower, get changed, meet down here, have a few drinks, something to eat. And um, so, Mark, you're in the hanging room. Yeah, the hanging room, yeah. So what happened when you was up there? So you'd gone up there, obviously, I'd, I'd to, to up get there. changed I'd, and go for a yeah, shower. I'd gone up there and started unpacking my stuff. That's when I heard, when I was stood up, I unpacking my stuff, I heard the, foot, the first really, really loud bang, and it sounded like it was coming from the room that's across from me, and there's only a curtain partition and the curtain was open and I, and I slightly thought to myself well did I just hear that unpack my stuff I was lay on the bed and to the left of me there's a fire door which I think goes to a a metal bridge that goes from one side of the castle to the other and I could hear distinct footsteps that were so loud it sounded like an actual person was doing it and I, I heard that two or three times so I sat there, I didn't take any notice of the first the first bang I heard, and then I heard a second one which made me look up. And it was such a loud bang, it sounded like the room was, or things were vibrating because of the, the loudness of the bang. Mm -hmm. And then about five minutes later, I heard a massive bang, and then Phil come up and I, and I said to him, did you hear that bang? And I think you heard the bang as well, didn't you? That did you? But you also heard the footsteps as well, which, yeah, I, I, I was, I, well, yeah, I mean, basically I was hearing footsteps. So where, where, where did you, where you, you went to the prison? Yeah, I'm, I'm sleeping tonight. You're sleeping in the, in the prison? In the prison, yeah. um, which uh, obviously uh, debtors and uh, other minor criminals would be locked in for us. Quite a long time to be truthful, if not for, for the rest of their lives, if they couldn't afford to pay their debts back. Um, but yeah, it's, um, so what it's a did, pretty what, spooky room, isn't it? it? Yeah. yeah. So you're in there, so what did you hear when, when you heard, was um, in the prison? When I was in there and getting, getting changed and stuff, I could hear footsteps um, that appeared to be coming from above, uh, which I assumed yeah, yeah, was Mark. And I was laying on the bed. Yeah, what I didn't realise was, yeah, as he says, he was laying on the bed. And I was hearing them at the same out. time. <laughs> yeah, I could hear the same footsteps that Mark was hearing. Um, I also believe that I heard a voice. Um, I don't know what it said. It was just like a, almost like a, a distant voice. Um, I, I suppose just to point out to everyone that at this point we hadn't set up 
the cameras in the rooms and where we're staying we were because I'm, I'm going to be staying up in Isabel's room, Queen Isabel's room, and I'm going to be surrounded by the apartments, uh, yeah. the, the chapel. I'm going the to be executive sleeping like suite where there's loads of loads. So of, I'm yeah. going to be sleeping. It's sort of in the middle with Hot all spot. these with all these rooms around me, um, and we hadn't got that far to set up our cameras yet. Um, the idea was we we're just going to chill out for a little bit and then get up there, put our cameras in our rooms as well, as well as handheld cams if anything happens, and uh, let the rest of the cameras run throughout the castle. But we hadn't got that far yet um, when you was experiencing all this activity. Um, there was a point once we had left and you was going to your areas, I made my way up to uh, Queen Isabel. Uh, Queen Isabella's room. Yeah, we've gone one way, and you've um, gone the other, one. not yeah. yeah, you went one way to the, to, through the castle, I went the other way, and within 40 seconds of walking down into the hallway, and I'm hoping that the static cam has got this, but there was a loud bang down at the other end, um, and I sort of had to stop, uh, and I stopped and sort of listened, um, and then I made my way into the, um, as I say, Queen Isabella's room, and I started unpacking my stuff. But even as I was doing that, I was hearing noises, and I knew it wasn't you guys because you'd gone to the, well, the opposite, other end, the other opposite end of the castle. So, um, as I say, we, we haven't reviewed any of the static cams or no. anything yet, or any of the audio, so we just have to see if, if anything was cool. Luckily, the static cam on the first floor was recording when I made my way to my room to get changed, and the loud noise was caught on the static cam, which seems to come from the other end of the hallway. We leave the old stable with the cameras still running and go and switch on all of our static cams throughout the castle. 15 minutes after we leave, there is poltergeist activity as one of the chairs inside the old stable moves, which is caught on one of our cameras. Our static cams are now in position. Static cam 1 is on the first floor hallway. Static cam 2 is in the chapel. Static cam 3 is inside Queen Isabella's room where I will be sleeping. Static cam 4 is in the solar room and banquet hall. Static Cam 5 is in the guard room and hanging room where Mark will be sleeping. Static Cam 6 is in the prison where Phil will be sleeping. And Static Cam 7 is facing the first floor staircase. We all make our way to our rooms to get a few hours sleep. I put a motion detector light halfway down the hallway and a music box which will activate if any movement is detected. As Mark enters the guard room and hanging room where he is sleeping, a voice is caught on the static cam swearing at him. in the prison and um, it's time to go to sleep. 
So, uh, well, let's hope I get a good night's sleep. Phil is on the other side of the building now. He's down in the prison. And I think that Mark is sleeping up in the guard room. He's also on the other side of the building. There is uh, no one around me. I've got this long hallway with four or five haunted rooms. Um, so I'm here by myself as well. So let's see what happens. As we are all sleeping, the castle comes to life. The motion lights and music box activate as they both detect movement on the first floor hallway outside where I am asleep. And inside the prison where Phil is located, there are loud banging sounds. <laughs> 